Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again for your time uh, for this presentation. Really excited to share uh, a couple of different approaches into how you can leverage ANSYS simulation to help with your EMC challenges, particularly around enclosures. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, like Conrad had mentioned, I am the electronics uh, manager here at RAND Simulation. So at RAND, we are an elite ANSYS channel partner. And what that means is, is that we can help you um, answer your engineering problems with simulation, whether that is um, helping you understand how to drive the tools or driving the tools ourselves and getting you the answers that you ultimately need. Um, I have a background in EMC. I've been in the EMC industry for close to a decade at this point, both on the hardware side, you know, getting things that are failing fixed, passing regulatory certifications, and now working here at RAND Simulation, developing the relevant workflows to ensure EMC success with simulation, which is something that's not super commonly thought of um, in the industry when it comes to, to EMI and EMC. So that's why I'm really excited to kind of jump in here. Um, so just a quick agenda of kind of what we expect to be covering today. So first, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about EMI, EMC, get everyone familiar with what we mean by that um, and why we re-leverage simulation in that sort of scenario. Um, after we get through that, we have two different types of solutions um, that can address these types of challenges inside the electronics portfolio at ANSYS. So those are both ANSYS HFSS, as well as EMA 3D cables. So we're going to touch on both of them, show you both what they look like, um, talk about why would you use one versus the other, um, how they can work together, a uh, whole, whole spiel on that that we'll go through, particularly around enclosures and cables. Um, and yes, so help you understand ultimately what that right solution uh, for you would be. We're here to help. So moving right in, EMI and EMC. So what is EMI? EMI stands for electromagnetic interference, and it is the undesired EM or electromagnetic waves that can negatively impact a device's performance or cause harm to nearby individuals. So whenever you have a device that's released into the market, you're going to have to go and test to a relevant EMC standard. So down here we have uh, a list of them that are probably pretty common. So FCC, RED, or previously CE, CISPR, ISO, um, whatever your product, uh, you know, whatever industry you're in, you're going to have specific regulatory standards that your device has to be tested to. And some of the different tests that you have to test are going to be conducted and radiated emissions um, or conducted and radiated susceptibility. And really what that means is, is, is your device causing problems? Uh, to the outside environment. So if you have a lot of noise coming off a cable and it's causing something um, nearby to behave erratically, well, that's your device's fault and you, know, you need to fix that. Um, similarly, say your device is close to something else and uh, your device is now starting to operate in a function that uh, is not what you expect it to because of those external fields. That's a problem as well. So being able to address these issues um, is really important for your device to be successful, and that's where simulation can start to come into play here. Um, just a little bit, just a little bit more talking through this. So some of the common things that we see in the industry for what creates EMI, it's going to be any sort of switch mode power supply, any sort of very fast changing in current or voltage, really, and that can be on your board or on your cables. So being able to identify that is, is obviously very difficult sometimes. Um, you know, we, if you think about in like a lab test, you could probe it uh, with like a near field probe, or you spend a lot of time inside of a certification lab, you know, spinning your wheels. Um, some of these things can be a little bit challenging. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more just specific. I kind of already touched on this, but just to kind of illustrate this a little bit more, uh, susceptibility versus emissions. Both fall under the same EMC or electromagnetic compatibility umbrella, but they're both a little bit different. So again, susceptibility is the measurement of the device's ability to maintain its expected functionality when subjected to external EM fields of varying frequency and magnitude. So if you have a susceptibility specification for your device, your device is going to be 
hit with EM fields of a known field strength over different frequencies, and you, your device is going to be observed in operation. And if it starts to malfunction, that's considered a failure. Uh, similarly, on emissions, your device is going to be um, evaluated and making sure that the fields coming off of your device, whether it's out of the enclosure or off of the cable or off of the PCB, is being uh, is low enough to meet the regulatory limits that are specified for your um, industry. And so why would we leverage simulation for this? Uh, so EMC tests can be expensive um, and they can only be done once you've already built your device. So the board has already been created. The device has already been brought up on the bench. You take it to the lab, you perform a spot check and you know, oftentimes you fail. Um, I think I had remember seeing some some quote from a, uh, a uh, national test lab that had said that up to 50% of all devices, it might even be higher than that, fail on their first pass to a pre-compliance test. And when that happens, you're kind of back to the, you know, you're back to the design board. You know, you're, you're having to one, address the issue, re-spin the board, and all of that's gonna add additional cost and time to your system. So the earlier that you can identify problems, the better off you're ultimately going to be. And ANSYS electronics uh, simulation solutions have different simulation characterizations that you can do depending on where you are in that cycle. So if you haven't even spun the board yet, there's analysis where we can actually look specific to the PCBs. Um, if you guys have already kind of identified the enclosure uh, or you're designing it, this is this webinar is very relevant for that aspect. But if, even if you've kind of moved along and you've failed, uh, you can use simulation to help pinpoint and understand more clearly why you may be failing. And so this is a nice graphic um, that uh, I like to show because it, it, it really kind of speaks volumes. And so what we're looking at here is, you know, on the y-axis here is just the number of problems that you encounter on the x-axis is what time in the design phase you encounter them. And you can see that if, even if you encounter a ton of problems that you identify from simulation, if you're still in that design concept phase, that's the best time to find these problems because it's really cheap to fix them because nothing's been made. But as you move further along down the development phase, you kind of expect to see close to like an order of magnitude increase in cost. And remember, cost is not just the cost of a respin. It's also the time associated that it takes to get that respin. It's the time associated for long lead time parts. It's all of that blended. It's the additional engineering time and cost to respin it and the debug issues. The more that you can find at the beginning, the better. Because the further along you go down this process, it becomes very impactful to your design product cycle um, if you find problems at the finish line. Uh, back when I was doing EMC design consulting work, that was a major frustrating point for customers where, you know, if they either don't have a lot of EMC experience and they think that they can just go right through FCC certifications, they're passing test one, they're passing test two, they're passing test three, and then they fail test four. Well, that invalidates all of the tests that they had done just previously, and now they're back to the starting point where they're redesigning their board and product timelines start to slip. Um, so anything that we can do before things have actually started being fabricated, the better. Um, it gets, you know, PCBs is one aspect, Enclosures is a whole nother side. You know, PCB spins, I mean, yes, it's timely, um, but ultimately it's a fact of life in the electronics design cycle. You're always gonna have at least one or two extra PCB spins. Um, and that's just something you kind of account for. Enclosures, on the other hand, oftentimes the tooling and the fabrication costs of that are gonna be much more prohibitive to where it is as easy to just Respin a new tooling for an enclosure um, that you happen to be customizing. So, particularly for enclosures, this type of simulation analysis is very relevant. So, that brings us into our first solution that we're proposing here, and that's using a uh, tool called ANSYS HFSS. 
And so ANSYS HFSS, it stands for High Frequency Structure Simulator, and it is ANSYS's flagship gold standard finite element method electromagnetic solver. And so HFSS is used for an enormous range of different RF and EM related problems. Some of them that are most commonly we see in the industry that users, our engineers will use HFSS for include antennas, transmission lines, which translates also into signal integrity analysis, as well as RF filters and other RF structures, and of course, EMI and EMC. For anyone who's not familiar with the ANSYS electronics portfolio, the electronics desktop acts as the home base for the different electronics solvers, um, particularly HFSS is one of them. And so inside the electronics desktop, we have a fully integrated 3D modeler. So you could actually draw up a enclosure. That's what I did here over on the right. Um, the two represents what your model is, but similarly, you can import in a MCAD file or a step file of your enclosure if you already have it. So say you've designed it in a, uh, a 3D CAD modeler tool, you can import in that model and start running analysis inside of HFSS. Similarly, you can also bring in any sort of PCB ECAD information as well. And so I mentioned gold standard. Um, I know that's kind of a, you know, a, a broad, broad statement to say, uh, or a bold statement to say, but this slide kind of explains why uh, that is correct, is that the reason that HFSS is so good at solving electromagnetic problems is because of its adaptive mesh. And so what the adaptive mesh is, is that if you look here on the left, we have our imported model. We've assigned all of our relevant material properties to it. We're ready to run a simulation. Once that simulation is fired off, HFSS is going to start adding in mesh elements onto the different structures inside of the design. And it's going to intelligently add more mesh elements where it thinks that it is necessary. And why does it think that it's necessary? It's because it's comparing the electromagnetic fields or the Maxwell's equations at each of those individual points inside of that mesh element and checking it to a previous adaptive pass. So it's going to do it once, solve the fields, and then it's going to add more mesh elements, solve the fields. It's going to compare them. And then it's going to say, oh, here, 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 and here, that was a big change. Let's add some more mesh elements there. And so it's going to continue to do that. And that's what you see here has occurred in this mesh is that around these holes and around these slots and around the copper fingers and the gaskets, the mesh is much more refined than on the outer surfaces of the model. And this is critical because not only does it give us an accurate result, but it also reduces the overall mesh size of the solution so that we can get an accurate EM results without over meshing the entire volume or the entire enclosure itself. The other thing that's great about this is, is that this is all done automatically. So you just specify your error tolerance or your convergence, and then it's going to take care of all of this for you. And then once that has been solved, it enables us to plot the electromagnetic fields within our solution domain. So here we have it plotted on the surface of our enclosure. And so there's a lot of different creative ways that you can use HFSS for EMC. So for one instance, what if we want to just create an arbitrary source? We don't want to go through and assign um, a linked field necessarily. We can, we certainly can from like another type of electronic solve, like say, for example, ANSYS SI wave. But say for you know anyone who just wants to evaluate an enclosure, I don't have a whole, or maybe someone who doesn't have a big RF background even. Um, you just know I need to test it at these different frequencies, and I want to know if my enclosure is going to let those fields get out. And so HFSS has this fantastic tool called the HFSS Antenna Toolkit. And we can see this over here on the left. And what that is, is it has a repository of different types of preset antennas. So for our instance here, we have a bow tie antenna. The reason I chose a bow tie is, is because it has a decent taper, which gives us a little bit of a, a nice bandwidth over span of frequencies to the left and right of that center frequency. So all I do is type in a 
frequency of interest that I want to be centered at, hit synthesis, it's going to create an HFSS model for me of that antenna, all of the excitations, all of the material assignments. I click a button, it's ready to simulate and it's ready for my model. Then I import in my, my uh, enclosure model, say that's from a step file um, or any other kind of 3D supported CAD type, assign the relevant material properties, and I'm off to run a simulation. Um, what's nice about this is, is that for someone who doesn't have experience inside of any sort of electromagnetic solver, this workflow um, is very streamlined for someone who doesn't have as much of a background in that. Um, to pick up and learn. Um, ultimately, of course, you can leverage this into much more advanced workflows from that, but this is a really great starting point for people who are interested in understanding a little bit more about enclosures. And so once we've solved it, we want to be able to see what um, comes out of this analysis. So we're able to get the S parameters out of our antenna, and it becomes more relevant here in a minute when we're talking about susceptibility or a simulated EMC test. Um, but when we're looking just specifically at, you know, we have a noise source inside of our enclosure, we want to see the fields coming off and getting out. And so HFSS enables you to plot the E field, the H field, the J field, the Q field, SAR, if you had a, you could bring in a, um, a human body model and have this next to your device if that's relevant to you and see what the SAR happens to be as it's escaping from the enclosure. Say you have like a, a body worn device and you want to see if the fields coming off of that are penetrating into the tissue and causing a SAR compliance issue. And we can also look at these fields both in a vector and magnitude format. So right now what we're looking at is a magnitude format where it's just plotting the fields overlaid on a surface. Um, but we can also use vectors to see the, you know, the both magnitude and the direction of those fields. And we can also animate these to even further understand how is this energy getting out of our enclosure? And so just a couple of quick modeling tips here for anyone who you know, maybe has HFSS or is interested in potentially this workflow is adding 2D sheets inside of your design allows you to create you know, cross sections for plotting these fields. That's what I've done here. So we have a top cross section. So from a top down view, a side view and a front view. And then also the scale can be user customized so that it fits within your design needs. So for example, if you wanted to adjust that scale so that you can very clearly see how much is inside versus outside, you can modify that scale accordingly to improve the visualization of these fields as necessary. And so here we've just got a couple animations of what this particularly uh, happens to look like. So here we've got our top view and so you know, from our, our holes are down here and it looks like the holes actually don't radiate out a whole lot of energy. So inside of here is the cross section inside the box. So that's why that's green and has a higher uh, dB relative of the E field. But I'm also seeing, you know, something kind of coming out maybe a little bit down here and a decent amount up this front side as well. Um, let's look at the other sides and see if anything else kind of jumps out at us. So now we're looking at the side view. And so we definitely see stuff coming out the top. Um, that's that's you know very clear. The top is not um, providing us a sufficient suppression at this frequency of interest, which happens to be one gigahertz. Let's look at the front. So the front again. This is a cross section of the front. Um, so again, we see stuff coming out of the top. We don't see that corner point as bad. It looked like that was more set into the corner. So maybe if we grab one more plot. Um, we can see a little bit more illustrated as to what's going on. And so this picture here gives us a little bit better visualization of my model that I've created. And you'll see on the left that the front is a door. So imagine that that's, in, you know, it is a press fit door. It closes, you know, for this enclosure. And I have a couple different common EMI filtering or gasketing approaches. So on the top here, I've got some you know, your beryllium copper fingers. On the left, I've got some, some conducting EMI gasket with the known spacing between. And then I've got the same EMI gasket all the way around the bottom. And then over here, I just have a little bit of a gap. So, you know, 
sometimes the gaskets aren't there. Maybe they're not ideal. Sometimes the compression has a little bit of a gap there. These are all things that you can represent and model inside of HFSS. And so then when we look over on the right, we're animating this versus phase. So really what that means is, is that we're able to see over um, a 180 or 360 degree cycle of the electromagnetic wave, how those waves are propagating. And we grabbed a cross section so that it's slicing right in between that, that opening. So we can really zoom in and see what is actually going on here. And we can very clearly see that that gasket not being there is certainly causing a problem. Um, the other ones, we're actually seeing it's not too bad. Obviously, the full gasket at the bottom is the best, but the other ones aren't as bad up the, off the top. We, can, we don't see a whole lot coming out there. We see a little bit up here at the top, but I think that that might be a little bit more due to those slots that we were seeing uh, earlier. And so what we can do with this is by visualizing what's going on, we can make the necessary changes to our enclosure uh, to make sure that we're achieving uh, the right amount of suppression necessary. Similarly, so I've been showing this all just plotting in a 2D uh, cross-sectional plane, but it's also very useful to look at it from a surface visualization as well. And so two of the most common field plots that I'll leverage for uh, surfaces would be the E field, which we're seeing here on the left, as well as the J field or the surface currents uh, present on the right. And you can see that in the, the surface currents that we're seeing a little bit more higher concentration, um, you know, a little bit more when we're looking here through that point. So it's just a nice additional visualization to see how the phenomena of this is getting out of your system to help further pinpoint those points of failures and necessary changes uh, to your model well before this has been sent off to fabrication. And so this one's pretty cool. So say we've, we've already identified that we have these slots here at the top as a major problem. So we ran that first simulation. It's clear that our my enclosure is not suppressing the EMI sufficiently. What do I do? HFSS has a built-in tool called Optimetrics. And what Optimetrics enables us to do is to create a parametric analysis that spans over user submitted or user assigned design variables. And this allows you to quickly understand and identify what sort of change would occur or what sort of impact your proposed change would create. And so the way that we did this is we took our model and then we drew a little bit of a, we just drew a box covering all the length of these slots here. And then that box has a width variable assigned to the variable reduction. And so as the reduction variable gets larger, that box is filling in the, uh, the space that those slots are taking up. And that box, it unites in dynamically into our enclosure. So that's why it's just, it's still the enclosure, but we're just seeing it dynamically change. And so what it will happen is, is it will modify the geometry inside of HFSS, and then it will fire off a HFSS simulation to evaluate the electromagnetic fields at that new model. So it's going to create an entire new mesh. It's going to resolve everything. And then it's going to be able to store all of the field information for each of those configurations. So here we can see as we increase the reduction, which therefore decreases the length of these slots, we can see that the amount of fields getting out is becoming suppressed. A couple other things inside of this optometric tool as well is we do also have a an optimization um, evaluation as well. So we could put a field point or an observation point, say up here, and then we can say sweep over a design range for this reduction and tell me the output that happens to give me the lowest field strength at an observation point of my choosing. So this becomes very powerful 
for that analysis. And what's nice is, is that you just hit go and it will go through and churn through all of these setups um, for you. So it will go through the first iteration and then it'll go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And this is a good point for any um, anyone who's already an existing ANSYS customer or anyone who's familiar with ANSYS HPC packs. ANSYS HPC packs allow you to one, accelerate your simulation by using additional cores, but two, it also allows you to solve these types of parametric analysis in parallel without having to have a second HFSS license. So for anyone out there who has an HFSS license or is interested in, in acquiring HFSS, that's a really critical thing to know because parallelization is going to speed up your overall sim time to get yourself a result that you need. But we also can take this a step further. We can also use that same antenna toolkit and create a representative test antenna. And we're starting to create an actual simulated EMC test environment. So for our example here, we have it as a radiated susceptibility. And so in this instance, you'll notice that our box is rotating. And so for this case, we had a design variable assigned that will rotate our model. And so we can see as it's rotating, you'll notice that at certain points, particularly where these slots line up perfectly with this horn, you get a very large amount of fields inside of your enclosure. So this is going to be able to help you also further understand um, and correlate to a EMC related test. What am I expecting to see getting into my box or what am I, and we could certainly run this in the reverse where what is this going from our box into the test antenna a set distance away. And what's nice about HFSS is so HFSS is a frequency based solver. So it's solving everything inside of the frequency domain, which allows us to view different uh, representations of the fields at different frequencies. So as we reduce the size of a slot, that means that only higher frequencies typically are going to be able to get out. So a, sh a longer wavelength is associated with a lower frequency. And so if you think about a structure like a cut or a slot or a gap inside of your enclosure, the closer that is to a fraction of a wavelength of a frequency that you're concerned with, the more likely it's going to have that escape out. Similarly, the shorter the wavelength happens to be, um, more energy is going to get out, um, excuse me. So at lower frequencies, they have a harder time getting out for the same size slot than they do in high frequencies typically. And so we can see and plot the S parameters. So from antenna one to antenna two, how much energy or how much loss we're observing at different frequencies. And so we can see is that the loss gets less as we go higher in frequency because those shorter wavelengths have a easier path into the enclosure and causing issues. But sometimes certain frequencies will have um, you know, resonances that can occur or you know, certain, you know, because this is again, it's an RF structure. So there's ways that certain frequencies can get in than others. And this is going to be able to help you capture that to give you the complete picture. And so then that brings us now into our second solution which is called EMA 3D cable. And so if HFSS is done in the frequency domain, EMA 3D is actually done inside of the time domain. And so EMA 3D is, is a full wave solver, but it uses the finite difference time domain or FDTD for solving the electromagnetic solution. Um, EMA 3D is fantastic for so helping solve EMI and EMC problems, particularly around enclosures, and cables. And so what we see here is, is that EMA 3D is actually housed within ANSYS Space Claim, which is our direct modeler. Um, it's also housed within the, the discovery modeling platform as well. And so here we have a enclosure that's brought in directly into Space Claim um, that allows us to perform these different types of analysis. Similarly, we're able to look at some cables understand their crosstalk, and then also still visualize the fields. So more on that here in the coming slides. And so when we bring in a model into Spaceplane, 
or EMA 3D, it's going to assign it very similar to like a traditional FEA kind of grid-based mesh. Um, and so this is really nice because it allows you to not have to necessarily make a whole lot of changes to your step plot that you may necessarily need to if you were to use HFSS. So for example, um, some of these really refined pieces inside of the circuit card may cause HFSS to mesh a little bit longer, um, so that, but they both have their trade-offs. And so it's convenient, especially if you're a mechanical engineer, if you don't have a whole lot of RF experience or modeling inside of HFSS, um, EMA 3D is a really attractive approach to just bring in your model, assign a general mesh. Um, it allows you to have a minimal amount of CAD cleanup um, necessary to perform the analysis. And so EMA 3D can do a ton. So we're able to assign just an arbitrary source inside of our enclosure or an incident plane wave hitting the enclosure. Um, but it also has some pretty unique workflows um, that are well laid out to utilize with one of our other electronics tools called ANSYS SI Wave. And that's what we see here over on the left. So ANSYS SI Wave, for anyone who's not familiar, is our power integrity and signal integrity analysis tool. And so what we do is, is we would extract out our S parameters. So for our instance here, we have a CPU here in the center, and then we have two DDR RAM chips over here on the left. And we extracted the S parameters. And for anyone who doesn't know what an S parameter is, it's just an RF representation of different signals that gives you the complete RF picture of your model of everything that you're including inside of that simulation. So for us, it's going to give us all the crosstalk, the reflections, the transmissions for all the clocks and data lines that we've assigned for this analysis. And then SI Wave is able to compute the simulated near fields generated from your PCB. And then that comes over into EMA 3D. So EMA 3D, we would import in our enclosure, we would import in a Kind of like a dummy footprint if you will for our pcb centered here and then we would use the near field analysis from si wave as a near field source for our ema analysis and then ema will compute um, using fdtb the time response of those fields propagating bouncing around inside of the enclosure and then also subsequently the uh, response and how much that field strength happens to be outside of the enclosure. And just like in HFSS, EMA 3D is able to do emissions and susceptibility um, in similar fashions. Um, it's just, you know, it's a different solver, but you're able to get similar answers to your question of, is my enclosure doing its job? And so here on the left, we have one of that emissions as shown from that board. And then we can also see on the susceptibility side, we have a source from the outside coming in through our, uh, our front of our enclosure. And you'll see here that specifically on this board, we actually have a just general simplified mapped representation of our PCB. So it's, it's meshed very um, in such a way that it's just kind of a simplification of the planes or the traces inside of your board. But what that allows us to do is then that allows us to have a set of cells to observe the field at different points on your board, which ultimately is what we're concerned with when it's coming to susceptibility is understanding one, how much field is getting into the enclosure. That's the first challenge. But then two, how much of this is actually coupling onto our board and of that is coupling onto our board is the field strength such that we would want to be concerned with it. Um, but another thing that EMA 3D has that it kind of stands aside from on HFSS is the way that it can model cables. Um, so EMA 3D has a means to accurately model cable harnesses and assemblies. So taking into account routing location, shielding, are they twisted pairs? Uh, what is the, and this is all going to be relevant to understanding what the crosstalk is between individual signals. 
So in this instance here, we have a cable harness with several uh, differential pairs or single-ended pairs, whatever you need, inside of a general cable harness. So people who uh, are in the defense industry, the aerospace industry, the automotive industry, anyone who has a lot of cable harnesses that have ever given them issues with EMA, uh, EMI, this is, this is the point where you really want to be listening. This allows you to model what the interactions will be inside of these cables, as well as how the entire cable harness system ultimately could be impacting from a radiation perspective, whether that's radiated emissions or susceptibility. And so our uh, setup here, what we're looking at is, is we have a cross section with several different um, signal pairs. And our original here is, is we have um, we have one, we'll call this one like the aggressor, and then we'll have a victim here just right next to it. And so we put a port on both of the two uh, signal lines of that analysis. And we can see yes parameters, particularly in the low frequency range. So from, you know, say uh, sub 100 megahertz or so, the original is really problematic. Once we get up to the higher side, it starts to be a little bit less uh, of a difference. But by just simply moving that around the harness, just moving it around a little bit, getting some, getting moving these around, making a little bit of extra space, we're getting in some areas close to 20 dB, um, in other areas close to even over 40 dB of suppression between those two configurations. So if you're ever having issues where you're seeing in your cable harnesses things are being that there's a crosstalk issue or you're having anything externally impacting those, but especially inside of the crosstalk, this is something you really want to consider thinking about because it could be as simple as just moving around where those cables are oriented inside of your harness. And this is another thing that I want to touch on and really stress is that EMA and 3D and HFSS, there's things that they can do very similarly, but it's not, uh, you know, team A versus team B, red versus blue. This is something that can also be used together. So HFSS is not able to model twisted pairs accurately in a large cable harness because the amount of meshing that's necessary to do that is just not feasible and in a reasonable amount of simulation time. And so EMA 3D can actually be used to extract the S parameters of your cable harness to be used in conjunction with an HFSS simulation. So for example, if you have um, multiple antennas or if you have a board-to-board -board connection and you want to see how the interaction from one board to the other goes through a specific cable and you want to model that crosstalk accurately and then solve the rest of the high-speed signal integrity on both of those boards inside of HFSS, you can bring in EMA 3D to help fill in that missing piece to get the really accurate result you need between them. Another thing that EMA 3D can do to help you in that same vein is modeling uniquely specific to the braiding of your shields. So EMA 3D is able to actually model over braid and the details of your actual braid. Because if you think about, if you've ever stripped off a coaxial connection uh, or a coax cable and looked at the braid or the outer jacket to it or any, any sort of cable harness, you know, sometimes it's gonna be foil, sometimes it's gonna be a braid similar like this. And in those instances, the braid or the foil is not a perfect barrier. So this, you know, the signal lanes that are running inside of this some of that energy is going to leak out to the outside of the braid. It's just reality. Uh, it, you're not going to have a perfect containment of that. And so EMA is going to help you accurately represent what that phenomena is, which you can then bring in to HFSS or use exclusively inside of EMA, depending on what your design needs happen to be. And so here we have an example where this is just like a pulse on the outside of the braid. And you can see that by changing the weave angle, which is essentially you know, how much of this open space essentially is remaining from the, the braid itself, you can see that 
the transient response is reduced when you make that smaller. So just additional layers of uh, accuracy and representation to your specific cables themselves. And so we talked about HFSS and we've talked about EMA 3D. Which one should I use? Uh, and that's a fantastic question. And the answer to that is, it depends. Um, and we're here to help you understand and answer what that would be specific for you. But here's just a kind of quick breakdown specifically between the two, um, just to kind of summarize a little bit. So HFSS is a finite element solver, which means it's being solved inside the frequency domain. EMA 3D is an FDTD solver, and it's solved inside of the time domain. If you look at um, who would be driving this most commonly, anyone who's already driven HFSS is going to be a little bit familiar with you know, the kind of workflow that I've described and can kind of follow that along. Um, so electrical engineers, people who understand uh, electromagnetic fields and their propagation, typically may lean a little bit more towards the HFSS side. Uh, conversely, mechanical engineers, people who don't have any sort of EM simulation experience, they're going to probably lean more towards the EMA side, you know, the, the, the direct import, the reduced amount of um, configuration to some of the CAD. Um, some of it's a little bit more streamlined and people uh, who are mechanical engineering backgrounds are going to probably feel a little bit more at home inside of the space plane realm. Um, but going into some of the things that they fundamentally do differently is, you know, anything where you have, I know, I know we talk about the enclosures, um, but if you also have any sort of small RF structures, or if you're trying to very accurately mesh uh, circuit boards and you really need to have all of the detail, HFSS is gonna be the way to go. Um, it's gonna be able to get you a more refined amount of fields. You can kind of see the, the resolution of how the fields look in HFSS versus EMA. But again, if you're just trying to evaluate from an enclosure, you know, that may not necessarily be relevant for you. So again, it's, it, it boils down to what are the needs and you know, what do you feel most comfortable working in? Um, some of the other benefits for HFSS is, is you would use it for parametric analysis. So if you wanted to do some of those different iteration changes, you can do that inside of EMA as well, uh, but you would just be you know, trying different configurations of a different enclosure for your setup. Um, but EMA, anything with cables, EMA 3D. So if you have any sort of cable harness, issues or if you want to understand the crosstalk in more detail specific to cable and the shielding around them, EMA 3D is something that you're going to definitely want to be leveraging, whether standalone by itself or as a conjunction in use with your other HFSS simulations. Um, both of them can bring in near-field links from SI Wave. Um, typically, we see that the workflow through EMA 3D is a little bit more plug and play, but both of them are able to fully capable of doing that. Um, and like I mentioned again, HFSS does integrate with EMA 3D to provide the complete picture um, as may do. And so that brings us to the you know the the end of the webinar. But really, you know, how can we help you? Um, so we are at Rand a end end simulate. We can we have an end end simulation workflow to assist you in your EMC design challenges. We talked specifically around enclosures today, but I want to stress that there that is just one aspect of the bigger picture around EMC simulation that ANSYS and RAN simulation can assist you with. So being able to understand all the way down to the board level how EMI is being generated is something that we can also assist on in conjunction with the enclosure analysis that we've described. And then as an elite ANSYS channel partner, RAN can assist you guys and in, in our customers in deciding which products to purchase. You know, which one do I want? Do I want EMA 3D or do I need HFSS? Or do I have a thermal consideration as well? Because, you know, like we, we talk about changing things in our enclosure, that can have implications with heat. So we have a, a solution inside the electronics portfolio for thermal solutions, or if you have a enormous uh, you know, server farm or a rack, large scale CFD solutions. We have an entire CFD business group that's able to help provide solutions to your needs from a thermal side as well. And then, like we mentioned, we also can help you guys through consulting services in all aspects of electromagnetic, FBA, thermal, and optical simulations. So if this is something where 
you find, you know, hey, we only do this once or twice a year, or hey, we don't have the engineering um, manpower to drive these types of simulations, um, or for whatever reason internally, it doesn't make sense to bring the tools in house, we can do all of this work for you to give you the results and provide you guys with the confidence that you are going to market with a design that's gonna work for you. So here's the best ways to contact us. Um, our website is just ransom.com. Otherwise, you can also email us at simulation at rand.com. And with that, I'm going to take it back over to Conrad and see if we've gotten any questions. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. And I just wanted to remind everyone that we are recording the webcast here. So, um, Feel free to uh, add in any additional questions. We do have quite a few here of like nine or 10 actually total. So we'll stick around a little bit past the hour here. Um, and if there's anything that we can't answer directly uh, on the call, we will uh, follow up with you directly via email that you provided in your registration. Um, so feel free to add in any more questions, but we'll uh, get rolling with some of the ones that came in here. So the uh, first one I have is from Mike S. Uh, is there a way to move that 2D plane through the box and animate it without rerunning the simulation? Do you need to make the variable post-processing to move the plane? Great question. The answer to that is yes. So the way that we would do that inside of HFSS, presumably, is, is that we, whenever we draw our 2D sheets, we are drawing them in a coordinate system that we have assigned. So naturally, when you start an HFSS simulation, you'll have a global coordinate system. But beyond that, you can create relative coordinate systems as necessary, whether that's to help you draw something, or in this instance, will change the location of a plotted field plane. So in that instance, what we would do is we would put in a relative coordinate system, and then we would put another one right on top of it. But that second coordinate system that's on top will have variables. So for example, if this is the, um, you know, the Z axis for us, I know it's not technically the Z, but say we're going up and down, we would put in a variable that would move the location of that coordinate system up and down and that would be assigned yes as a post-processing variable and from there we would draw our sheet referencing that coordinate system so then once this is simulated we would be able to animate over that distance we would be able to basically sweep up and down what that plane is looking at so whether it's front to back side to side or up and down great question all right so we have two that are, I think, a little bit similar here, uh, Matthias, from uh, Audi and then another um, audience member here. What kind of material data is required for these simulations? And then I think just to add on to this, we have one that is, can you run simulations for EMI on other enclosure materials, not just metals? Yes, the answer to that is yes. The material is just an assignment inside of these solutions. The common types of material properties. So what I will say is, is that both EMA and HFSS have a large library of materials that you can leverage. But if that doesn't fit within your specific type, say for example, you have a unique, um, you know, part of your design has a unique type of plastic, or if you have like a ferrite type of material inside of your model, um, or if you have a unique type of steel, the types of parameters that we would be able to look for is permittivity, permeability, magnetic and dielectric loss tangents. And that's gonna be typically found inside of the data sheets um, from the vendors of those materials. And then we can go in and create a custom material if the one that we're interested in doesn't happen to already exist. And then that can be excuse me, reused for future designs after you've created it. Okay, looks like we have another one here from Gary. Uh, last slide on section one. I think he's uh, speaking of HFSS here. Yep. Uh, the FEM yep. code 
you did you solve at each individual frequency to look at the fields at each frequency what is the best practice setup so the way that this works is that the adaptive process allows you to specify what frequency you want to solve your mesh in and so in that sense you can pick a single frequency so for um an, an instance for a like one gigahertz we could just pick one gigahertz and that will usually work for a decent span above and below that point but if we want to look at a very broad band range of frequencies what we leverage is what's called a broadband adaptive mesh so we specify a low side we specify a high side hfss will solve the fields on the mesh at each of those um, points within that range and make sure that it is converged at all of those individual points and then that will be the overall mesh for the entire solution because it's a great question different frequencies um, if you go really high in frequency a low frequency mesh is no longer going to be valid um, and so being able to capture over that entire span is, is a very good thing to keep in consideration and HFSS, once that mesh is solved, it will run through a frequency sweep. And the frequency sweep is if you think of the mesh as the equation, the frequency is a variable into that equation that can be changed and it will give a different output. And so the frequency sweep will then plug in different frequencies that we wanna solve for to visualize over different spans of fields. And that sweep can be chosen at discrete points or allow it to interpolate over a range depending on what sort of output we're looking to see. Hey, we have a few more here. They're just uh, trickling in. So let's see from uh, Travis. And, and just so everyone knows, I'm trying to spread these out because there's several people that ask two or three questions or more here. So let me just try and uh, be fair and, and give everybody a, a quick roll through here. So from Travis L, uh, as a mechanical engineer, I'm more interested in EMA 3D. Maybe I missed it, but is there a way to do a parametric analysis for radiated susceptibility within EMA 3D? Yeah, so there, I believe there is a way to optimize through parametric analysis inside of space plane. Um, I believe it may have to leverage ANSYS Workbench. Um, but that's a good question. That's something we'd have to you know, take offline and, and take a little bit deeper look into. And um, if there is some interest there, we can certainly follow up and um, get you guys a better answer for that specifically. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back with you uh, via email here. So Travis will be in touch uh, from Nick. Does RAND or ANSYS have canned setups that correspond to industry EMI and EMC standards? Yes, or do. can you give us a guide, sorry, or can you guide us for a given scenario? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so inside of HFSS, there is a preset EMC setup for conducted emissions, radiated emissions, and bulk current in injection um, to the CISPR standard. Um, but if your standard is something different, you know, we can certainly work with you to develop the right workflow and uh, identify what ultimately you guys would need for um, that setup. But there is a lot of pre-existing information inside of just example files. And then also there's what's called the ANSYS Learning Hub. And inside the ANSYS Learning Hub, there is user uh, you know, self-paced training, webinars, and live instructions that go through the different process and setups, as well as the theory behind all of these different types of electromagnetic and EMC types of simulations, both for HFSS and for EMA 3D. Okay, great, let's see here, we have a few more. Um, let's see, from Elirio uh, B, what's the size scale for the examples you've discussed? And can you comment on the simulation time and accuracy implications and feasibility for larger shielding structures so i think he's asking for like uh what's what uh what are the different variables on the scale and the size for the different uh Great models questions. yeah so for this one i want to say this is like your traditional kind of 
server rack size. So maybe foot and a half by foot and a half roughly. Um, the HFSS model here that I've designed, this is, about a, this is about a three foot long box by about two feet top to down. And this is being meshed at one gigahertz. And so the simulation time for this specific model uh, was probably on the order of maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And that's uh, utilizing uh, like a four core laptop. So the accuracy around the simulation will be dictated by your convergence criterion. And so the lower amount of error will drive a larger simulation mesh and a longer simulation time. A lower, a, a higher error will you know, be the reverse. The other thing to keep in mind as well is, is that the more objects that you have inside of your simulation, that would be another aspect to drive that simulation time. But if you have very large structures, um, there are other solvers inside of the um, HFSS that you can leverage if necessary. If we're talking a very large structure, it's going to start being more relevant inside of EMA 3D, where by using the FDTD code, we're able to solve larger structures like you know, big racks or large, you know, very large shielded enclosures as well. So it really just depends on what your specific application would necessarily be to identify which one makes the most sense to use. All right, we have, <laughs> they just keep coming in here. Uh, so we'll stick around for another few more minutes, but um, I just wanted to mention that we'll get back to everyone individually that did ask questions via email. Uh, we have a couple more. Uh, so from your experience, what ends up affecting a product from becoming compliant or passing necessary tests to be commercially viable? And what is the most common thing you see going wrong uh, in a design? I would say the most common thing that I see going wrong in the design is either an incorrect implementation of the cables or an incorrect implementation or a, a non-ideal implementation of the PCB itself. So if we think about how EMI is generated, oftentimes it is fundamentally a signal integrity and power integrity problem. So either there's noise on the power, there's noise on the signals, and that's leaving the board in one way or another, whether it's coming off the board and radiating that way, or it's coming off of a cable and radiating that way. So being able to just reduce the overall noise profile of your design, which again is a simulation workflow that is, you know, we didn't cover here today, but is something that is certainly relevant to this discussion. That's one thing that we find is probably the most effective is just fixing the problems at the source. So adding uh, potentially shielding on the board itself. Um, again, looking at your enclosure, mitigating any sort of ground current loops that are present inside of your design, making sure you have solid reference planes, sufficient vias and grounding, and sufficient decoupling um, and filtering on your data lines or your power lines, if, as long as you're able to you know, not over filter them um, for, in the sense of digital. But anything that you can apply to your board and make that cleaner is going to help. Moving that further, understanding and evaluating, do I have the best implementation of my cable? Do I need to ground the, the shield or do I leave the ground floating? Um, those are some of the questions that EMA can help you answer to ultimately find the, uh, the answer that you need. But I would say mm -hmm. fixing it at the board and making sure that your cables are routed effectively so that they're not acting as antennas are all things that um, will help fix those issues. So then we have a couple that are very similar here. Um, a couple of people want to follow up on a few things and then I will uh, tie it into the question is we have a, a potential client here that um, has a, a design project and uh, they're looking to benefit from some of these different simulations, but they don't have necessarily have ANSYS yet. And how could we help them uh, during their prototyping phase? 
yeah, so we can help them by, you know, getting the, you know, getting locked in um, with you, understanding their problem, prescribing a simulation solution, and then we can execute that ourselves. And maybe that's just kind of the first toe that's being dipped into the water for EMC simulation, or maybe even simulation entirely. What we can prescribe is, is that say that works and that's that's successful. Hey, we want to bring these tools in house because we're seeing the value that it's providing. We at Rand also provide a collaborative consulting approach where we can help you guys get access to the tools, learn how to drive them, and start being proficient at them yourselves as well. But if that interest isn't there, we always have the ability to to perform these analysis for you. All right. Well, I think that uh, wraps up the vast majority of our questions here. We're, we do have to wrap things up for today. And as I mentioned, uh, there's going to be a recording of this available on our website, say likely within the next 24 hours or, or less. Um, I'm going to be working on that soon here. Uh, we'll also be sending out a follow-up email with the recording. Um, and then if there are any questions, or any of the questions that we have, we'll follow up with you uh, directly to make sure that you can uh, speak speak with someone here at Rand Sim and we get you the, the help that you need. And I just, again, wanna thank everybody for attending and really appreciate all the time. Uh, we look forward to talking to you and, and working with you on future projects. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody.